Here is the recipe for Coca-Cola. This is the original formula that its creator, Confederate veteran and famed morphine addict John Pemberton, used back in the 1880s. The flavor comes from a combination of citric acid, vanilla, lime juice, coca leaves, caramel, alcohol, orange cinnamon, lemon, coriander, nutmeg, and neroli, which is extracted from orange blossoms. Nowadays, the Coca-Cola formula is considered to be one of the longest held and most closely guarded trade secrets in the world. But back in the 19th century, Pemberton seemingly wasn't all that worried about keeping it a secret because he wrote it down in his diary and then was irresponsible enough to die. Now, this is obviously not the same exact formula they use today. Three years after his death, a guy named Aza Kander came along, purchased the rights to Pemberton's formula, modified it just enough to make the first 30 seconds of this video useless, and used it to start the Coca-Cola company. During the time that he ran the company, Kander made one very peculiar decision. He let the initial 1893 patent on the formula expire in order to keep it a secret. You see, you can't just hand the patent off as a piece of paper that says, I'm not going to tell you what this is, and demand the right to sue anyone who sells it. Patenting a recipe or a formula also means divulging exactly what that recipe is, at least to the patent office, and usually also to the public. So as the Coca-Cola formula continued to evolve under Kander's leadership, the company wouldn't be obligated to tell anyone what had changed, so long as the formula never got leaked. Why Candler chose to do this, and why Coca-Cola continues to operate like this to this day, is something we'll get to in a minute. But first, the fun part. How do they actually keep the recipe a secret? Well, for decades, the recipe was allegedly never even written down. It was just stored in the hearts and minds of a few select employees, which is a great place to store a recipe because there are all sorts of bones and stuff to keep the recipe safe. But that changed in 1919 when a guy named Ernest Woodruff gathered a group of investors to purchase the company. In order to secure the loan he needed to make the deal, Woodruff needed something to put up as collateral. So Woodruff asked Handler's son to write down the recipe, which would sit in a vault at the Guarantee Bank in New York until Woodruff paid off the loan. When Woodruff got the paper back in 1925, he moved it to a vault in the Trust Company Bank in Atlanta, and then finally in 2011, the company moved it to a specially designed vault at the World of Coca-Cola, where the public could ogle at how behind a vault door it was. With the recipe itself being completely inaccessible, a few people at the company still need to have it memorized. Who exactly these people are is a little unclear. According to this 1985 legal opinion concerning a lawsuit from Coca-Cola's bottling companies, two anonymous employees in the company knew the recipe. And this has basically been the company's official policy for decades. Two unnamed people know the recipe at any given time, they aren't permitted to travel together in case Pepsi starts investing in domestic terrorism, and when one secret holder dies, the other must pick a successor to learn the formula. Now, that's the company's official position, but there's been a lot of speculation that more than two people know the formula, and the company's messaging is even a little inconsistent on this subject. Sometimes they say two, but sometimes they use phrases like a small group. The point is, the formula is a secret, and the people who know the secret are a secret, so it's extra super secret, I guess. But okay, if the formula really is truly a secret, then that raises a much weirder question. How do the manufacturers make the thing when they don't know what thing they're making? Well, the company just uses the same technique that I use to keep my writers docile and obedient, by keeping them perpetually in the dark. But, like, Coca-Cola does it in the idiomatic sense. The people working in the syrup factories don't actually know what ingredients they're mixing. The different components of the soda show up at the factories with cryptic labels. They're called merchandises 1 through 9. So people shipping merchandise 5 to the factory might know that merchandise 5 is actually the thing that makes soda spicy, but they still don't know what the other ingredients are, and the people who deal with all of the ingredients all at once only know how to combine them. This is the same way that KFC keeps its spice blend a secret. They mix half the ingredients in one factory and half the ingredients at another, so neither factory has the complete recipe. As of the time I'm writing this video, the public has actually figured out what about half of the Coca-Cola merchandises are, so uh, if you were wondering what merchandise 4 is, it's, it's phosphoric acid. I hope you enjoyed that little fun fact. Now, the big brain folks in my audience probably have a question lurking in the back of their big brains. Is all of this really necessary? Like, what would actually happen if someone did steal the recipe? Well, we actually know the answer because that basically happened in 2006. A group of employees at Coca-Cola stole a bunch of confidential documents and a vial of a new syrup formula, offered them to Pepsi for $75,000, and then went to federal prison because, like, what was Pepsi supposed to do? Start selling Coke-flavored Pepsi? That already exists, and it's called Coke. The reality is, there isn't much of a practical purpose for keeping the formula secret, even if it is unpatented. No one's going to buy your I stole the exact recipe of the most accessible soft drink in the world and made it more expensive soda, and even if they would, you wouldn't even be able to legally source all of the ingredients that Coca-Cola uses to make their product. Fun fact, there is only one company in the US that can legally import coca leaves, and they sell the cocaine-free extract to the one company that is legally licensed to use it. 
Coca-Cola. So then, what is the point of all this? Why create such an expensive and logistically complex system just to keep a useless secret? Well, you just watched a six minute video about a product that I'm not even being paid to sell, so you tell me. But first, let me tell you about something that I am being paid to sell. Sweet, sweet stock footage. As you might have noticed, I use a lot of stock footage in these videos. So much of it, in fact, that my stock footage dealer Storyblocks asked me to be a sponsor. And honestly, I was so happy to say yes because Storyblocks basically built my whole career. If you're a new content creator, a student, or a professional who makes any kind of video whatsoever, Storyblocks is for you. A membership to Storyblocks not only gets you access to a massive library of stock footage, that's right, you don't have to pay for each piece of footage individually like with almost every other stock footage provider, you also get a huge library of sound effects and music, after effects templates for things like channel logos or slideshows, and access to their super easy to use video editor called Maker that has all this stuff baked right in. If you're going to make any kind of investment in creating any kind of video, Storyblocks is the perfect starting place. It has absolutely everything you would need. I still use Storyblocks to this day, and I truly cannot recommend it enough. Just click the button on screen or head over to storyblocks.com slash HAI to sign up, and you'll be supporting HAI while you're at it.